Okay, so what I'm going to show you now is a little bit about ND filters, how to use them, how to get the exposure that you want. First of all, it's what length of shot do you want? How long do you want the exposure? Because anything up to 30 seconds you can do in camera. Um, you know, so you haven't really got to use anything special to, to, to work out the calculations for your exposure. Um, you can even put the ND filter on. And if you use live view on your camera, or if you've got a middleless camera, you're just viewing the screen on the back, basically you can see the exposure. So what I mean by that, with the ND filter on, anything up to 30 seconds, you can make your settings and physically see the exposure that you're going to get. So that can be really useful. You don't know what the end result's going to look like, because obviously you're not going to get the smoothing effect and what the ND filter's doing, but it will show you the exposure of the shot when you take it will give you a rough guide. So anything up to 30 seconds and settings let's say on your camera always choose ISO 100 uh, if you need to shorten the shot for any reason you could go up to 200 but that's where you're going to be working. So manual mode ISO 100 and then select the aperture for the type of shot that you want. In other words most time for long exposures you're going to be using the the higher ranges of the f-stop on your aperture so probably from f11 f16 something like that because you're going to be in most cases it's used for landscape photography and that type of thing or even light painting you want a lot in focus and also you want to cut down the light so you're going to be using small apertures so i f numbers so let's just say f16 for, for the sake of it, F16, ISO 100 and then all you do then is select the shutter speed that you want to get the length of exposure that you need. If you're not using an ND filter, same method yeah. because if it's dark or whatever you can still use exactly the same method same settings, same, same way of working. Once you get over 30 seconds things change because you can't use the live view to see what you're going to get because you can only go up to 30 seconds so if you're going to do exposures of 1 minute, 10 minutes, 15 minutes even which I do sometimes in light painting uh, you've really got to think on how you're going to achieve what you want so you've got to know the exposure now it works in mathematics now in most cases I would say with ND filters if you're just getting one, I would probably say go with a 10 stop. That will give you the most versatility to, to get what you want. You can change your exposure and bring it down or whatever should you need short times. But that, that for me would be the most sensible one if you're just going to buy one filter. If you can afford lots, go and buy them. But if you're just getting one, I would say to, to be you know, working in, to, to get these really nice shots where you want a really long exposure, the 10 stop will give you the most versatility. Then you need to work out when you're using that what your exposure time is going to be. And by far the most easiest way is first of all you're going to be shooting in bulb mode. So on your settings on your mode dial on your camera you will need to change up to bulb. Um, because and the way that works then is when you press your finger on the button it will just take a picture until you release it now obviously that's no good uh, trying to do it that way when you're doing landscape or anything like that because what if you've got a finger on the button the camera's going to move on your tripod so what you use is a release cable so you need a shutter release cable and that's usually got a lock on so you fire the button and you push it forward and it locks the exposure until you physically turn it off or some have got timers on where you can set a time in there and it will do all that for you as well. So whichever method you use, that's the way to work. Ball mode and cable release and a sturdy tripod. To get your exposure though, then you've got to work out the length of time to get the correct exposure. So the way to work and this is by far the easiest way, there are other methods, you can use mathematical, uh, mathematical calculations, I can't, because maths is my downfall, I can't do mathematics, 
So I use a phone app. So what you do is you set your camera up, you select whatever aperture you want uh, to get the shot. So let's say ISO 100, F16, and we're going to be using a 10 stop filter. So without putting the filter on, I'll take a shot and I'll get the exposure that I want, first of all, without just light wise, not the actual physicalities of the shot, you know, if you want smooth water, you're not going to get that. You just want to get the exposure correct. So you take a shot, you get exposure, and then you look at what shutter speed you actually use. So let's say it was 1 200th or something like that, 250, yeah? You make a note of that. It doesn't matter what it is, it could be 1 30th of a second, whatever. You make a note of that, and then you can use an app. And I find the easiest one um, to use, let me just find it. Here we go. So it's called the Noisy ND Calculator, or Nissi. I'm not sure how you pronounce that. I do use their filters. It doesn't matter if you do or you don't. Um, you can still use this calculator. But if you have got the Noisy filters, then it's, uh, it gives you the names of all the different filters I've got. So when you open that, and it's spelled N-I-S-I, -I, so Noisy ND calculator, it looks like this. So what you've got on there at the top is the filter that you're using. So I've got it set on 10 stops and it also gives the, the product name for the noise. Now it doesn't matter, you just look at the amount of stops. When you buy an ND filter, it will tell you the amount of stops that, that it stops the light. So you put that in there and then you put in the shutter speed that you use. So let's say I used uh, 1 200th of a second to get the exposure correct without the ND filter on. It will then tell you underneath and you've got also for exposure compensation. I'll, if you're shooting manual, I'll, I would never need that. So I'm not going to put that in. Uh, but it will tell you underneath it says the length of time. So it says five seconds. Can you see that? So what I can then do is put my cable on. It says five seconds. I press the start button on there and it will actually time that down to when I need to take off the release. Now you can do that on some of the the actual gadgets that you use for your, for your shutter release cable. Some have got that on. You can put the time on there. You can do it that way. Or you can use this to time it down and then it will tell you when it stops and you take that off. So really useful. So, and I find that one the easiest one to use. There's lots of different ones out there, but that's nice and simple. All you've got to do is put the shutter speed in, put in your ND filter that you're using, how many stops, and straight away it will give you the, the correct exposure to use. So I do suggest use that one. Next thing, we haven't really had a look, have we? The different ND filters that you can get. You can buy a kit. So this is the Nice Nice I. <laughs> still don't know where you say it. I'll call it Nissi. Nissi uh, filter collection. So I've got these coming kits. So you can get various kits. And you've got a holder that holds the filters. So the filters slide into that. And in there it's, it looks quite dark because I've got a, a 10 stop already on the holder there. And the bit that fits to the camera is this part. So that screws onto your thread on your camera. There's different threads available to fit the lens that you're going to use. And you can get different sizes as well. So that's handy because you know you can if you've got two lenses or whatever that you use for your uh, landscape photography you can get two filters and this will fit all so you screw that onto your lens and you can see it's also got a filter in there and that's a circular polarizer so that you can put in or out you don't have to have it in there but it's also got a little dial on the top there that turns the circular polarizer around because that's how a circular polarizer works you can have it on or off by simply rotating the filter round to get the effect that you want. So you don't have to use that. 
and that will give you an extra two stops of light usually if it's on so that again cuts out an amount of light then you've got the 10 stops so really with this on it's about 12 stops um, there we go so as I say you can get different rings so that those fit onto the back of that so if you've got a different size lens you can make them fit these parts are all bought individually by the way so you can get the filters individually you can get the holder individually you can get kits different types of kits that fit on there and then that fits onto the end of the lens they are more expensive I got this in a Black Friday deal very very cheap and I bought it straight away because of the price I've done really well with that you've also got a different filter which I haven't got with me at the moment but you can get um, soft grads and hard grads and what they do is it's like an ND filter that gradiates out so it's dark at the top light at the bottom and you can use those and fit in as well so you can combine different ones so you can have the, the tent stop in there and you can slide another one in in front of that and you can I think you can get up to about three different filters that you can put over the top of each other so they can be useful I don't usually use those because I do usually multiple exposures for the sky and, and for the foreground and do it that way but a lot do use them and they can be handy the soft grad I think is better than the hard grad. The hard grads are okay with seascapes where you've got a hard line so you've got the, the sky at the top and they cut off fairly quick so you've got um, a denser part at the top that stops the light and then the bottom's clear with quite a hard split in the middle. So it doesn't affect the water, it just affects the sky if you're doing those type of shots. The trouble is, is if you've got mountains and things like that it causes problems. So a soft grad is just a softer gradation from dark to light and more useful I find. So soft grads I do use occasionally and quite often in, the, in not that way that I want to darken the sky. I quite often use them with a waterfall where you've got light coming from the one side and it's hitting the water and that side is quite brighter to the other side and that quite often happens on the one particular waterfall that I shoot at Goit Valley the light's always coming from the one side and it's just too strong compared to the other side of the waterfall so I'll put a soft grad on but I'll put it on sideways so the dark side is on this side and then it goes clear on this side and that can then stop that amount of light coming in on the waterfall so again really useful there's other ND filters as well which I quite often use to be honest and I've got one on the camera at the moment so these actually screw straight onto the lens uh, and it's like everything that you buy the more expensive ones are the better ones if you get cheap ones they create colour casts quite nasty these are not overly expensive um, and it's a company that I use quite a lot. That's B&W, and they're quite good, quite an old company. that They've been manufacturing these for a long, long time. Don't know what the price is. I haven't got a clue. I've got that one second hand. Uh, but that's a tent stop again. I nearly always use tent stops. Very rare I use anything else. And they just screw onto the lens like that. Of course, you can't use soft grads or anything like that. But... They're handy because they're nice just to put in the bag, you know, and also you get no light leaks, so that can be a problem as well when you get lights, uh, light leaking in on some cheaper kits with the ones that slide in. Mm -hmm. If light gets in between, that can cause bands of exposure across your shot and it ruins your shot. So I tend not to, I tend not to get cheap kits because <laughs> that happens quite often. You can use tape. Mask, uh, the black gaffer tape is quite good uh, you can put that over on there and also something else that's really important if you're not using a mirrorless camera and you've got a DSLR make sure when you're doing long exposures that you cover up the eyepiece on the back because what happens with that if you get light going into the back of that that can ruin your shot so that's really important to remember 
you can get little caps that fit over there or like I says just put a bit of tape over there black tape to stop any light going in there or hang your hat over it <laughs> that's what I do uh, but I've got a mirrorless camera now I don't need to do that but it is something to think about because not a lot of people do think about that and they can't understand why they're getting all these light leaks on the images and it's because light coming into here can affect the image on a DSLR camera okay so that's one type and a very similar type I find these quite handy I haven't actually used it yet but I've heard you know they are a good make these are K and F concept and these work in a really nice way especially if you, you've got a number of filters so that part the ring fits onto the the lens just like all the other ones so you screw that into the lens and then what you've got is you can buy the different filters that are actually magnetic so these just once you've got that in there that'll, you just put it on like that and you, you can just pull it off so they're nice and quick and easy to, to change or to take off completely just to do normal photography and what you also get is you can get a magnetic uh, lens cap as well so that just oh and you can just pull those off so here we go so not nice nice little kit those and nice if you're changing using different filters and you can stack them as well so if you've got two ND filters you could put two on so if you've got a 10 stop you can make it into a 20 stop or you could get you know you can do that what you have to watch out when you're doing that though with these type is the vignetting it can create because the thickness of this can give a little bit of vignette in on the lens well that's quite easily removed in most cases and this is really severe okay so that's a little bit about the ND filters watch the rest of the video for a bit more information things you can do and I've got four different categories here of three of them what I've done and also some images by a man called Jay Kick who's a photographer who works with gels and models so we're going to look at the, the different ones Landscape and architecture. Let's start off with this one. Okay, so this was taken in Liverpool on a recent trip. And this was a long exposure. Now, what, what do we mean by long exposure? Anything beyond the norm, really. Uh, where you're creating an exposure to, to create an effect in this case. So what we wanted is movement. So it's just a merry-go-round. There's, there's horses on there. You probably can't see the horses because they're swinging around quite fast. But the rest of the, the roundabout on there is creating the shape, the blur of the lights going around. So, I mean, you can just about see a horse over here. You can see the legs and you can maybe just make out one there. But everything else is, is moving around. The old, the old thing about doing this type of photography, first of all, you need a tripod. That, in most cases, this was done without a tripod, which I'll talk about in, you know, in a moment. But in the majority of cases, when you can use a tripod, great. That's what you want. And you want a good, sturdy, solid tripod. doesn't matter how expensive it is. You don't want one with flimsy legs. You don't want one that's going to wobble about and move. It must be a good, solid tripod. But with this shot, I didn't want to carry a tripod around it. On a camera club trip and some of the buildings we went in, obviously you can't use tripods and things, so I didn't want to have the asshole of carrying one around with me. But luckily, the, the camera I've got has got in-body stabilisation and in-lens stabilisation as well. And the two combined together means that I can take an image a few seconds long in most cases, I've even done up to five, six seconds and holding. I think I've done longer than that um, and, and quite successfully. As long as you don't shake too much, you can, you can get an image like that if you've got that uh, use. Obviously, if you haven't, it's a tripod job. Now, in this case, it was only a two-second exposure, so it's not overly long. And that's learning the trick of the trade. If you look, I've got people on the left-hand side. They're all in focus. Within that two seconds, they didn't move. 
subscribe because I wanted those subjects in there. If I'd done a really long exposure, they wouldn't probably even be on the shot. You wouldn't see them. They'd disappear because it won't capture them unless there's light on them and they're, and they're stood still for an amount of time. So in those two seconds, I got the movement that I wanted. And this is the experimentation side. Never take one shot. Try different lengths of exposure. And up to 30 seconds, you can do all that all in camera. You can set any exposure time up to 30 seconds on nearly all cameras. When you come to over 30 seconds, we'll talk about that later. But with this two seconds, I got the effect. This one, again, same trip, and just across the road from where we was taking that image, we was actually going back to get the coach to go on. And I was stuck halfway in between a road there with traffic going past, and I thought, we'll do some long exposures. So using the rail that you can see on there, I use that to steady myself a little bit more. And again, that was just a two second exposure. Again, it's nice because we've got a person on there and he's not blurred, he's, he's kept still. And we've got the shot. So we wait for the bus to go past, we hold down the button and we've got the shot. So again, two second exposure. There we go. Now this one's a lot different, quite an old shot, this one. And all I wanted on this was the movement in the clouds. So there's a little bit of wind and the clouds was nice and fluffy and they're moving around. So I created a long exposure in the daylight. Now, unlike the other two, which was taken at night, if I'm taking a long exposure in the day, that's quite hard to do because there's too much light and you can't get that long exposure. So this is when you start using things, you may have heard of ND filters, neutral density filter. And there's different types, you can get kits, the, you know, some that looks like a little box that you fit on your NDV lens and you can slide in square filters on those. They're the more expensive ones. And you can also get cheaper versions. I wouldn't go too cheap though. You know, uh, probably about 60 pound upwards for a screwing filter is, is probably gonna give you something reasonably decent. So you can get screwing filters as well. Can't remember which I used on this, I've got both, probably the the square ones on the end there and this is just enough exposure time to get that movement in the clouds and using the ND filter they enabled me to do that because without that I wouldn't be able to so ND filters I will do a video on those separately and also for those attending the club I will mention it on the night another example so in this case, again, rather than sky, I've got the sky as well, I wanted to smooth out the water. So just a long enough exposure, the feminine lighthouse there at Anglesey, it gives me that little bit of reflection on the water of the lighthouse and it smooths out the water, it's quite choppy. So that, that's the effect that it creates on that. Again, an ND filter, a 10 stop ND filter on that. And that was probably taken 20 to 30 seconds long on that. Really important that you've got a good tripod for these type of shots, especially. Now this one I've chucked in, it's not one of my better shots at uh, this location. I like it, it's okay. But there's a comp special composition I like here, which we use all the time where I want that tree in between those mountains at the back there is where they dip down and, and meet each other. And that's usually where I like to position the tree. Unfortunately on this, someone was in the way. But I've took so many pictures of this tree. But the thing is the long exposure. Why do I use the long exposure on this shot? Because I want to get that water silky and reflective. So, so I take in all the chops out of the water to, to get that shot. Exposure time, I can't remember exactly, probably 15 to, to 30 seconds uh, to get that. But the important thing about this image and the reason I've put it in is because it's when do you use an ND filter and when don't you or when can't you? And I see so many shots of this tree where people make the mistake where they think I've got to use an ND filter. I'm a landscape photographer, I must have an ND filter. And they stick it on, they take a shot of the tree and they may think it looks all right, but they're not in other cases. And the whole reason is what's the subject? It's the tree. And if you've got a bit of wind and you're doing a long exposure, what's going to happen to the tree? 
it's going to be blurred it's going to be moving around and your main subject is going to be ruined also the other trees going around the trees on the right hand side there that you can see they're going to have slight movement in they're going to look all blurred so learn to use the filters when they're going to help you to create a good shot and not to create a bad one because if you've got the wind blowing the tree around you're not going to get the shot just do a shot without the nd filter see what you get so really important that one one to think about now this again taken at night so this was taken with the help of a torch to light paint the the trees and that and also the steeple on the church which is quite dark so standing on the other side of the the water there which is minster pool that's um litchfield and we've got the steeple of the cathedral there and you tell it's a long exposure because we can actually see the movement starting to come in on the on the stars in the sky you can see the the, the little slits that almost looks like rain coming down doesn't it but that's the stars so when you start going over 20 seconds with the stars and that they're going to start to you're going to see movement in there you may have seen somewhere that you can get a complete circle using software i'm not really into that but i do like astral photography it's something i've not done a lot of but um, in this case it's just about right and how to light paint all all of that so and it was just a little very powerful torch but not a huge torch you don't need anything massive little led torch that's powerful and that allowed me to light it all up so if you need to light it up a lot you need a longer exposure so this is using a bulb setting rather than using manual mode and, and using an exposure up to 30 seconds i needed much longer than that to light all that up so therefore that was oh i don't know it could be five minutes i'm not sure can't remember exactly to light all that up so again you've got to think about your time and experimenting and that's the beauty along it. it's fun if you do it you know if you do it regular you, you'll have fun doing it but you could take a shot for 20 minutes and it may look rubbish and you've wasted 20 minutes but you haven't because you're learning and that's the important thing it's something you've got to practice and things like this you can practice on easily go you know go somewhere at night and have a play another night shot same litchfield uh, and a little bit of painting with the torch on this not a great deal but i wanted to make sure that sign was lit up so i used the torch on there and a little bit of torch light on the, on the path just a little bit just to bring it out and of course the window was lit so didn't need anything on that that's the exposure that we got another example of flattening out the the water and i think the only reason i put that in is because i used an nd filter plus a polarizer on that so a circular polarizer not to a great effect there i, I, I used it to bring out that blue in the in the sky and in the in the water and also you can just see under the water you can see some of the rocks and that if you use a, a circular polarizer you can turn that so you can see things that are under the water a little bit so it's just bringing that little bit of rock that's under the water out just in that section and another night shot fairly straightforward just like the others there we go okay so that's landscapes and architecture waterfalls so another use of uh, long exposures right button there we go okay so probably the most trickiest one to get right because a lot of people you know again it's something you've got to experiment because a lot of things come into the element of, of shooting waterfalls one thing is how fast is the water moving how much volume of water there is um, um and how much blur you actually want to put on that and quite often people do too much and you lose all the texture in the water it just look, doesn't look nice it just looks white and it's overexposed so you have to experiment a little bit and after time you sort of learn it's quite often now very rare i have to think about it i know roughly what i'm going to get uh, because i've done so many and, and that's simply through use and, and practice but when you start off 
try different shutter lengths. Now, sometimes you don't even need an ND filter. If you're in quite dark conditions, you don't need that on. I think I did use one with this uh, because it was a little bit of a brighter day. But if you, you know, if you go out early morning or later at night, you can get exactly the same shots without using an ND filter. So that one, hard to say, probably about eight seconds, something around like that. This one, a little bit longer, that was just some water, part, little part of the waterfall, and I wanted to capture that light coming down, also that rainbow effect that the water was creating at the bottom there. So a little bit longer with that one, again, tripod really <laughs> required for these type of shots. Now this one, it's quite a short exposure. So you can see there's more texture in the water, it was moving quite fast, I didn't want to blur it all out, I wanted a bit more texture in this shot. It was more really about the the dying flowers on the on the rocks there that I could see, and an overall shot rather than the water. So, about probably a fifth of a second or, or less even on that. Now this one, more um, more length of exposure, but again not over the top. Uh, probably ten seconds, something like that. The water was bursting down there and it was falling behind the tree and it created this umbrella. This is at Goit Valley and I took the shot a, a million times. Again, not one of the best ones, but it shows the example of the water. Uh, and it creates that lovely effect. So you've got to experiment again. You've got to take a number of shots to get that length of the water and to get the look that you want when it's coming on like that. So I didn't attempt it in one shot. I took a couple to get the, the length that I required. And the thing is, when you're doing landscape photography like this, is you've got a lot of time. It's not like you've got a bird who's sat on a rock and you've got to get a shot straight away. Take your time. Take more than one image. Really slow down. And, and I think when you do slow down, you'll get the better shots. Again, a shorter length of shutter speed. So probably a third, fifth of a second, something like that. I wanted that bit more gritty look. And, you know, unless you do a number of shots, you can't make that choice once you come on. So make sure you get lots of shots, different exposure times to get what you want. And slightly longer with that one, because the water really on this, there wasn't that much. So I had to use a longer exposure. And it just come out nice. It's not too blurry. It's still got that texture in the water, and that's the important thing. That's why you've got to take a number of shots. And also thinking about the weather again in this shot, because you've got a lot of vegetation. You've got the, the ferns at the top and the grass in the foreground in that bottom corner there. And if that's moving, you're not going to get the shot. So think about the conditions when you're doing this type of photography. Another example, a bit like the other one, same location. To there so waterfalls always more than one shot well, I would say that about all photography actually but um, you know to get what you want you really got to experiment now we're going on to light painting so just a few examples on here so light painting I used to do a lot of we haven't done any just lately which uh, not for about a year or two now except little experiments with clubs and whatever when I've gone out doing talks. So, okay. <laughs> this really is experimental. So in this, we're not using 30th of a second or anything like that because you would never get all that amount of work done in 30 seconds. We are using the bulb setting on a camera. Now, when you're using the bulb setting, which you have to use over 30 seconds, the camera won't allow you, in most cases, to, to go any longer time by using the camera. So you have to use what's called the bulb setting. And the bulb setting basically means when you press a button, the shutter remains open for the length of time that you've got your finger on that button. When you let go, it closes. So how do you keep it open? Because if you just press it and let go to do things, that's the shot. And also it could be blurred because things could be moving. 
So what you have to use is a cable release, a shutter release, where you can lock the exposure. So that plugs into your camera and you press a button and you usually push it forward and it keeps the shutter open while you do things and then you release it. And of course you're not shaking your camera because you've got it on a cable and you can just do that. There's also phone apps as well that you can use. I hate using phone apps, especially when you're working at night because you can run into the shop and your phone's lighting the picture up and you forget and everything becomes a mess up. Much prefer a mechanical device, but that's that's me. Okay, so creating this shot. This could have probably took about 15 minutes even. You know, so a number of things to go over. First of all, the lights were used. We used one of these kids disco lights behind the car that sit in the ceiling. So th this is actually a, under a bridge uh, in Tamworth. And the bridge crosses a canal and it's got lots of little sections like this, the bridge underneath, where people can walk through. You're not supposed to put cars in there, I will be honest, but uh, we've got away with it. We were stopped by the police once and they was very polite and says, well, you're not really causing any problems, carry on. But your car shouldn't be under here. But they, they, they was quite nice with us and, and let us carry on. They could see we was creating no damage. Um, but again, there's lots of graffiti goes on in here, so that, that's another reason we use that. All the graffiti on the walls looks fantastic. The flames go around the car, so let's explain that first. How did we do that? So basically, that's one of these uh, like burners that you can get for, for taking off paint and things. So it's like a, a, a cylinder with a nozzle on where a flame comes out of it, and that's on a stick. And basically, you light it behind the car, you walk around the car with it on the floor, in a circle. And the speed that you walk around is important, because if you stand still too long, it will burn out. It will just become white light. So you've got to keep constantly moving, just go around in one big circle, and it will capture that. It won't capture you walking, because you're not lit up. Dark clothes are best. So... You know it's not gonna it's not gonna create that all you're gonna catch when you're doing this type of photography in the dark obviously is whatever light appears into the shot so the car isn't lit nothing's lit it's all total darkness so we've got to provide the light and that's a nice thing because then you can be creative you can build up your picture we've got the light on the ceiling that's going on that's being captured we then put the flame around the car now in between doing all this if we kept that shutter open too long What's in the background there, that would be overexposed. Because, you know, if we got it open for 15 minutes, you can see the trees are quite well exposed and things like that. So to stop that, what we do we, after each section when we do little little bits is we put our hand over the lens while we go on to the next part and get things ready. Then move your hand. It's not going to record that. It stops the light going into the camera. That's all it's doing, so you just... Quickly put your hand over the lens, take it away when you want to start again, and you can continue to do your work. So the the car itself, which actually belongs to Steve Moore, people in our camera club, well now Steve, it was before either of us was in Rugeley Camera Club, but uh, this is from a few years back. So he's got this lovely Spitfire car, and that's what we was doing, spitting fire all around it. <laughs> set fire to it. No, we didn't set fire to it. In the background, we've got wire wall. So, wire wall, you can put in, if you've seen one of these whisks that you can get for food, a metal one, it's got to be metal. Uh, we use one of those, and it's got a handle on, steel handle, a little cage, and you put in the wire wall inside it. You tie a piece of string on the end of it, so you can whiz it around your head or whatever, swing it round. And you get a PP9 battery, one of the little square ones, with the two contacts on the top and if you just touch the wire wall instantly it will burst into flames and you start swinging it round and you can get all those creates the sparks coming off and the circles in the background so that's so i'm going across and doing that again it's not recording them they're moving all the time it's just creating the light and you see all the sparks bouncing off the ceiling so just on the edge of there that creates our background Bit overkill this one, isn't it? There's a lot, lots going on in there. And then we've got these swirl of lights in the in the foreground, the blue and the purple. That is a stick with um, 
little LED lights on and we just swirling it round in, in the front there to create that effect. The walls, they're not lit. So a torch, somebody goes along with a torch, just paints that. So we work in little teams to get the image. And you don't get many on the night. You could spend 15 minutes doing that and then it doesn't come out, you know, it could be rubbish. Quite often that's happened and we've had to redo it all. So settings on this, I think I used usually around F11, something like that. So I'm getting everything in focus on there. And really importantly, this is with all most long exposures, we shine the light on the car because what you've got to do first of all is to get the focus that you want. Remember, it's dark, so you can't see anything. You can't focus on anything. So we shine the light on the car with a torch. You get the focus. And then you change your lens from auto uh, autofocus to manual focus. And once you do that, then your lens will stop in that position. It's on a tripod. Nothing's going to move. That's the first stage. Really important that you do that because... In the dark, it's, it's just going to keep hunting for the focus. So manual focus, everything that you do with these long exposures. Get your focus first, switch over to manual. Okay, so that's what we've used. F11, uh, ISO, you can, you know, it depends on how much light and how much time you do it. 100 to 200 usually is what I use for those type of shots. A lot use 100. Basically, it means because the exposure comes from the torch and the lights. Um, so, the amount of time you've got that light on that car, painting it, so you're walking around the car with a with a, a torch, shining the light on it to light it all up in the different areas. If you get too much light on it, it's going to overexpose. So, all that is practice. So, your ISO doesn't need to be too high because you're taking time to make sure you're covering all the car. But it is experimental. You never know what you're going to get till it's finished. And that is all the fun, I think, for me. I, I love it. You never know what you're going to get. It can look spectacular or it can look rubbish. And there's a lot of work that you can see that goes into each shot. So, you know, you've got to enjoy doing it, basically. This one is just a guitar. So the, the effect at the back is actually a plastic bottle with a torch in it. Uh, going around in a circle, so I swung around in a circle, and then using the end of the bottle to go around the guitar to create that bit of a haze around the guitar, and then the circular light that's going around there, the thin light, is um, like a fairy light with a, I think it was anyway, a fairy light with on a piece of wire, just swung around a couple of times, and that creates the swirl there. This one is probably the most technical and hardest to do, uh, especially because I was doing it all myself. So <laughs> it's uh, quite a lengthy, a lengthy shot, this one. So I've actually done this one in the house, I think. So dark room. And everything created there, a lot, well, most of it, was created with one piece of triangular perspex. So I cut the triangular perspex, and cut a little shaft on it so you got like a shaft and then like a diamond shape going to a point with a little shaft on cut out of the perspex and then that went into uh, like a black handle I created and I think that was a part of the end of an old hoover you know those extensions you can put on for, for doing under the chair and down the side of chairs and it's got like a, a slot on it so I pushed the perspex in that, then glued it all up, made, taped around it so no light could leak out of that. The only light going through it was through the edge of the perspex when it was pushed into the, the tube. And then you put a torch on the end. And the torch then just shines through the actual perspex and lights up all the edges especially. So you can paint with it. And that's basically, I used my body shape and went over it, keep moving it clicking it around, extend my arm, go over that section, then put it in my other hand, go over the other arm, down the body, create all that. And the parts at the back was created with a tube, with a, a torch in, rotated with a flashing light. So the way I got that effect is to use one of those torches, LED torches, and it's got like an SOS type thing on it, or you can make it flick on and off. 
So you got when you press a button, it will flicker on and off. So you put that in a tube with the colour on, you swirl it round in a circle, and because it's the lights coming on and off, you get those bars as such created, which is repeated on the floor as well. X-ray shots, as I call them. So this one's first. So basically, you get a torch, you lift up the bonnet on the car, and you light paint the engine. You put your hand over the lens, so recording no light, you put down the lid on the bonnet, you release your hand away from the lens and you paint the top of the bonnet while it's down and that's what you get. You have to practice. The length of time doesn't have to be too long when you've got the bonnet down because it'll be too solid, but how long you paint that will create that, that shot. This one's probably a better one. So again, this is the, the MG, it belongs to Steve Moore, and nice engine, so exactly the same thing. The only Photoshop on there is those little dots going around the edge there that I'll just put on to fill up the black space, but everything else is just straight at the camera, that's how it comes out. Same as, as before on the other one. And another one of two different types of MG, a modern one and the older one. Same thing with the, the light, the gas cylinder for the flame around there, uh, little disco machine on the ceiling, and of course we got all the, the great graffiti in the background that's under the tunnel. So that's it, light, light painting, lots of fun. And you can do, you know, things in the house, it can be a toy, it can be anything, you know, you can really go to town on things like that okay last one these are images not by me they're by a photographer called jake x because i just wanted to show you i have done types of things like this but i haven't uh, got any of my images available unfortunately and it will be something i want to do a little bit more so it's working with models and working with flash and also light painting so when a flash goes off it catches the subject instantly and in most cases, when you're doing model photography, that's it. That's the shot over with. But if you use a longer shutter speed, the flash goes off, catches the image, and then you can use your light painting tools to paint in the effects on the model. And there's a number of these different effects. Some, you know, you get that blur as well. So all using the same technique. And you can get very, very creative okay so that's it on long exposures